Quran, which was revealed to him by the angel Gabriel from Almighty Allah, it clearly states, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنُ وَالْإِنْسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُونَ Some of our other programs, we've elaborated on this even more. But specifically here, we're talking about the translation more or less to be, God is telling us that I only created you guys for worship, to worship God alone without any partners. This is what Muhammad taught. So as a prophet, as a messenger, as a servant of Allah, he was teaching us the correct belief and what to do about that belief. Following the correct belief in Allah, the next thing is to believe in the angels, which we mentioned in the earlier segment. To believe also in the books, all the previous revelations, and of course, the Quran itself. And following that correct belief, in the books, we also know that he taught and would have us believe in the resurrection, which we've already mentioned. And then finally, and this is a very important part of the belief in Islam, is the belief in the predestination or the qadr of Allah. Predestination, fate. In other words, that Allah has full knowledge of everything that's going to happen, even before it happens. This is one of the subjects that we'll be talking about in more detail in our series about lifting the fog. But specifically today, I want to focus on Muhammad and what he taught and who he was as a prophet. There are many books, by the way. Reams and volumes of pages have been written about the life of Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. Specifically, what we want to do today is just help us to understand his role and do we worship him? And of course, the answer is no, we don't. In fact, we worship the God of Muhammad. Just as it mentions in the Quran, talking about the prophethood of Jesus, saying that Jesus called his people to worship my God and your God, my Lord and your Lord. And in the same way, Muhammad is saying the same thing. Worship your God and my God, your Lord and my Lord. And nothing different than this. Let me explain what happened at one particular point in the life of Muhammad, peace be upon him. He didn't ask to become a prophet, by the way. In fact, he was rather surprised and, and amazed that Allah would choose him to carry this message. When it was evident to him that he needed to bring the message to his people, he stood in front of them and called them all together. And then he asked them, Who am I to you? And they were saying that you're the truthful one. You know, we believe in you. Whatever you say, you don't lie. You're the spirit of truth. Then he he said, if I told you that there was behind me, behind the hill here, an army of people coming, would you believe me? They said, absolutely. So he was showing them an analogy here. I, if I warned you about an imminent problem, if you have uh, army is going to attack you, would you believe me? They said, absolutely. And then he said, then in this case, and watch now what he says. La ilaha illallah wa ana rasulihi. He said, there is no deity worthy to be worshipped except the law, and I am his messenger to you. Now imagine, these people should just say, well, okay, that makes sense, but instead they became very angry. Why? Because they understood the message that he brought, meaning something very profound. And by the way, the word Allah was a word well known to them. They knew the word Allah. He didn't just say to them, that I am God, and you have to worship me. He didn't just say to them that there's only one God and you have to worship Him. What he said was, there's nothing anywhere worthy to be worshipped as a God, except Allah alone. That's the meaning of what he said. And that's why it was so profound. It meant that they had to give up any false worship. We today would understand that more profoundly if we realized that it meant we also couldn't worship ourselves. We can't worship our position our status in society, or our race, or our nationality. All of these things where we boast ourselves up to be more than we are, to put something ahead of God, this is a, a, a way of worshipping that instead of God or along with God. This is better to understand when we talk about worship in the Arabic, it's better to understand it when we talk about this ibadah. But when we bring it to English and we start using these other words, that's when people begin to get a little confused. Which is again why we wanted to have these segments these in this series dealing with these words and how we understand them. Muhammad as a Rasul, as a messenger, but not as a God. 
Muhammad as one who is a Nabi. That's another word in Arabic for a prophet. But again, not as a God. Not as someone to be worshipped, but rather one to direct you, to show you the proper way to worship. And by the way, he didn't force anybody to enter into Islam. He never did. In fact, that's a very important part about the correct belief in Islam. That there is no compulsion. That it has to be from the free will of the individual to select, to do what God wants him to do. Otherwise, it wouldn't be real Islam. As we've discussed in other parts of this series, Islam means the choice of submitting, surrendering, in obedience and sincerity, and in peace to Almighty God. But the key focus word here is what? Choice. You have to make that choice. It has to be from you. Now, we talked a little bit about the things that Muhammad brought and taught. And one of those things, when we talked about the cutter, we're going to have a segment all for this particular subject, predestination and understanding how that works in Islam. We want to be sure that you take advantage of this whole series as much as you can to learn what the teachings of Islam are in the English language, in simple English terms. Very frequently, I see the problem of a person trying to explain Islam in a language that's not their native language. It becomes difficult for them. Especially when you're trying to translate from it. The Arabic language is very powerful, by the way. To translate from the Arabic to a language like English, which is, by the way, very weak when it comes to the subject of belief or in worship. There are a lot of words in Arabic for things that we don't really have in the English language. So, we can sum all of this up to say that a lot of the misconception that people have about Muhammad is because of the way that they look at how they worship. For instance, Buddhists or Christians who worship Buddha or Christ might consider that we're worshiping Muhammad. Well, this isn't the case. Those who worship God in everything for instance, they said, well, God is in this, and he's in you, he's in me, and so and so. They might also consider that we worship Muhammad, and we don't. He is not our Elah. He's not our Rub. He's not our Lord. But rather, he is the one who represents and brings the message about Almighty God. Once we clear away some of this fog and the mistranslations, misunderstanding, then it becomes easier to understand the true role of Muhammad, who he really was, what he taught, and what our responsibility is as followers of Muhammad. It is true, by the way, that we should always say peace be upon him when we say his name. Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's correct. But not because we're worshipping him, because we're praising Allah for having sent him. And we're asking for Allah's mercy and peace to be with him. Yes. Also, in our prayers, whenever we mention Muhammad in our prayers, it is to ask for Allah's mercy and blessing on him. But be, be sure you understand that we as Muslims do not turn to Muhammad when we have needs. We turn to the same God that he turned to. It is wrong, really, to call upon Muhammad. Because, first of all, he is dead. And second of all, even if he was alive, we wouldn't call on him. We would call on the God that he called upon. So when you hear people say, Ya Rasul, Ya Rasul, O Muhammad, O Muhammad, Unless he was there and you were calling him for something, like saying, Oh, come on to eat. Ya Rasul, ta'am. Come on, Muhammad, messenger, come on and eat. Something like that. That would be understandable. But to call upon him in a supplication and ask Muhammad for something, for instance, Oh, I want to get married. I want an education. Oh, uh, Muhammad, I need money or something like this. This is an act of shirk or associating a partner with Allah. This is where the people before us went astray in worshipping and asking from Jesus rather than asking from the same God that Jesus asked from. I keep comparing Jesus and Muhammad in this segment because I want to clarify for those who have been in the Christian religion, studied the Christian religion, and then done a comparison with Islam to fully understand that it's not correct in Islam to worship Jesus nor Muhammad. That whenever we have needs, we don't supplicate to them, but we supplicate to the God that they supplicated to. Muhammad prayed, and he asked many things from Allah. Likewise, Jesus prayed, and he asked many things from Allah. And you'll find this in the Bible, 
and you'll find this also in the Quran the same way. So when there are supplications, when there's asking, this has to be directly to Allah, not to anyone or anything that Allah created. A way to sum this up in a simple statement is to simply say, we do not worship Muhammad, but the God of Muhammad. Or, we do not worship the creation, we worship the creator. Whatever Allah has created must not be worshipped. Whatever you can see, or hear, or smell, or taste, or touch, or imagine, all of these things are what? These are the creation and must not be worshipped. We cannot turn to these things for our needs. We can only turn to the Lord above, the Almighty. We'll have more segments like this, inshallah, God willing. So we hope you'll look for these clearing and lifting this fog of misunderstanding about Islam and what it teaches. This Yusuf is Yusuf reminding you that if there is guidance, it'll only come from Allah. If you want guidance, ask Him. May Allah guide us all. Amen.